Good morning. My name is uh, Brian Gallagher. I'm the CEO of United Way Worldwide. Uh, we'll be doing this session in English, uh, not because our panelists can't speak French. Each one of them can. Sadly, your moderator cannot. So uh, I apologize for that. We'll be doing this session in English. Um, we, uh, we will keep uh, our comments brief and then have a, have a discussion among uh, the panelists and then also uh, hopefully take questions from, from you. The, uh, and I will, I will not do the formal introductions. You, uh, as each speaker has their opportunity to speak, I'll say a bit about their background contextually, but you can read their, their bios. You know, the, the, uh, the title of this session, uh, The Status of Healthcare in Africa, Challenges and Opportunities, seems pretty apropos given the fact that there are clearly significant challenges and significant opportunities. Um, there's been real progress made in healthcare across the continent in the last 15, 20 years, life expectancy is increased. Uh, child, uh, childhood um, health outcomes are better. Um, death from communicable diseases is down. Um, but clearly that progress has been uneven and we still have many challenges across the continent. Uh, Africans uh, endure 17% of all the disease in the world and yet are 11% of the population. 50% of all expenditure for healthcare in, across Africa is out of pocket. Um, only 1% of healthcare expenditures worldwide is in sub-Saharan Africa. And a fact I learned just getting ready for this session, there's a 1.7 trillion US dollar fraudulent drug issue uh, across the continent of Africa. Uh, couple that with infrastructure, poverty, violence in some places, the shortage of trained professionals. Clearly we have challenges as well as opportunities. So as we think about in asking the panelists their thoughts on opportunities and challenges in the future, whether it's inpatient care, outpatient, um, preventative care, diagnostic services, is maybe to think about the way that President uh, Kagame last night described, he was asked the question, did you look at the Singapore experience when you designed the, the governance model for Rwanda? And his answer, um, paraphrasing, was we looked at everything. Um, he wanted to create a Rwandan system. And what I would suggest is that there is an opportunity um, given the evolution of healthcare across Africa to create an African system, not a US system, not a French system, not a Asian system, but an African system. And that's what I've asked our panelists to think about. So to think about challenges, opportunities, and, and, uh, and then the path forward. First, let me ask uh, Nardos uh, Bekele Thomas, who's the resident coordinator of the United Nations in South Africa, but has been uh, stationed in many countries throughout Africa, was also interestingly stationed in the Secretary General's office to manage uh, affairs there, so has a broad experience from a UN perspective as well as in country. And Nardos, I wonder if you'd share your perspective on, on regional challenges, opportunities, national and, and overall. Thank you very much. Um, I think you now start by contextualizing everything with the latest development that happened at the General Assembly just uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, there was a high level meeting conference on universal health care. And there were, I think, seven points which I have gathered from that uh, meeting. The first one is really for universal health care to happen in any of this world, you need political leadership political leadership at all levels. And political leadership that makes sure that there is a coordination between governments, vertical and horizontal linkages. Because a health minister is not the political leader. It's all the ministers that have to deliver on that. The second point is we have to uphold the leave no one behind. Um, you know, this is something that the SDGs 
have been promoting, and there should be equity. We cannot subject the marginalized people, the poor people, to only uh, mediocre health services. They have to be eligible to a full-fledged good health service, integrated health service. The third one is quality. Quality is very critical because the MDGs, you're right, uh, Brian, uh, we have delivered on that in Africa. There are primary health care centers all over Africa, but the quality is wanting, and Africans need quality health services, and the government has to make sure that that is delivered. The fourth thing is regulate and legislate. You have to make sure that health services and medical professionals are really clearly regulated. And that is also not only just from the services point of view, also we just talked this morning from the management perspective also. Management of hospitals, management of uh, stock, stock of medicines and, and all this. And that would take us to the training aspect of it. So we need to have trained, skilled professionals to deliver health services. The fifth one, which is critical and very important, is we need to invest and invest better than what we did before. The 15% pledge that we gave in Africa is not all fulfilled, except with very few countries. So we need to invest and we need to move together. To deliver health services, we need to have our research institutions, our technology institutions, our academic institutions to all deliver on the promises that the government has given. I give the example of South Africa. In South Africa, people think that you know South Africa is a sophisticated country. Yes, it is a sophisticated country, but there are two countries in one country. The country that has high tech, you know, healthcare system, which caters for 10 to 15% of the population, and the country that has really mediocre, like least developed country, where there are basic uh, health services, free by the government, um, but which caters to the 80% of the population. And the 5% there and there, we can put it as the middle class being part of the 10% that get uh, high health uh, services. Uh, we have 153 medical schemes. Each organization is obliged to have a medical scheme. The government gives free uh, for all uh, primary care to as long as they go to a public health services. And therefore, you know, the public sector is really stretched, underfunded, and, and really um, does not have all what it takes to cater for the, uh, for the poor. Understanding this, the government has taken two important measures. The first one is to introduce the national health insurance scheme because the private sector is monopolized. There are three companies that deliver, you know, good services, high tech services to the population. Therefore, you know, and the prices are of course so high uh, that the poor cannot afford it. So the national health insurance scheme, one, aims at lowering the cost of healthcare at all levels. Two, make sure that each and every citizen of South Africa gets the healthcare services integrated that it requires. Three, it makes sure that you know, there is a management of information and data in the hands of the people so that they have the liberty, the freedom to choose wherever they want to do. Information about themselves, but the information about the mapping of whole health service facilities in the country. So this is what they are trying to do is a very, very tough thing to do. The government spends 717 billion, has pledged actually this year at the State of the Nation's address. The president said that he is going to put in place 717 billion rands per year for healthcare. 717 billion rands 
translated into dollars is $71.7 billion. As you know, South Africa is a heavy HIV burden country, with the exception of, you know, um, USAID, the PEDPAR program in the Global Fund, the government funds totally the HIV AIDS. So, you know, it's really, government is, is really very, very keen in that. But unfortunately, corruption takes 22 billion rands per year from the 717. And the re recent investigation by the government reveals that, and there is an action now taken to curtail corruption at all levels. So, so we'll probably come back to that, this, this issue of corruption and transparency and governance, but using South Africa as an example of two countries in one and the complexity of the issues, I think is a good one. We'll also hear from Pierre about Nigeria and in, in in using a very large, complex country example. Let me next turn to uh, Dr. Julia Tuakli, uh, who's the medical director and founder of uh, Family Child and Associates in Ghana, um, a public, uh, public health expert, a women and children health uh, expert and practitioner, and an academic. And uh, so a very nice overview, Nardos, of the issue. Juliet, is from a practitioner's point of view, what are the challenges and opportunities and I think specifically you're going to talk a little bit about technology and the role of technology in, in care going forward. Ghana's, um, most of you must know Ghana, I'm sure, but Ghana is in a rather unique position um, insofar as it is one of the countries that is hailed as doing very well with its national health service, which with its um, capacity to try to raise the level the standard of care for most of its citizens, which is all true. Uh, I think Ghana didn't fall into the trap of providing free care at the National Health Service level because um, I think, and I was cer certainly in agreement, getting anything for free in any population probably is not a good idea, and health is no exception, even if what you pay is minuscule. And so uh, the, go the government, in its wisdom, has charged a very, very, very modest amount to those citizens who are eligible for National Health Service and have rolled out a pretty impressive program. The problem with Ghana is that it is in the middle of the West African hub, and um, some of our larger neighbors, such as Nigeria, where I'm from, I'm not saying this to be negative, uh, do use services, as do many of the other countries. Liberia is another case in point. Uh, certainly in my practice, we see people from all of the West African countries, especially Nigeria and Liberia, where the services really are much poorer than they are in Ghana. And certainly they do have a deficit at the public health level. But even within Ghana, even within the National Health Service, which has been designed to provide, to the best of its ability, a broad coverage to a relatively large population. There are gaps which I consider to be quite important. And yesterday, listening to Paul Kagame, I was reminded of this, because within the National Health Service, there's no special area for women to seek care. And traditionally, women will not seek care until their children, their family have been taken care of. And it does show up when we look at the statistics of uh, the services that are provided, number one. And if you look specifically at the health status of women who are enrolled and registered with the National Health Service. So I think there needs to be a little bit of tweaking so we can empower and advocate access, more access, if you will, for women specifically. Um, we have done a good job with lowering child mortality and morbidity, actually. Uh, but we have beautiful, shiny new roads, courtesy of China and other large countries. And the rate of road traffic accidents is beginning to negate some of the gains that we have made regarding some of our uh, mortality and morbidity. It's a, an ironic situation. Um, many of us in the public health sector had been monitoring the rise 
of non-communicable diseases. Obesity is particularly important. Diabetes is another. Hypertension is almost epidemic. Um, but certainly, when one looks at the specific numbers, one will see that road traffic accidents trump all. And it's definitely been increasing with the number of roads, that uh, number of highways. Um, public health issues were not taken into account, by and large, when some of these roads were implemented, i.e. crossovers for pedestrians to use, side roads for school children to use, um, even roads for bicyclists to use. We have large number of people who do cycle when they can't afford motor vehicles. And so they are fair game, unfortunately, along with the goats and the cows and other things that sort of uh, find their way onto the, the highways. And I really think we need to, within the National Health Service, also look at road safety education for the children at the school level, primary school level, perhaps even further up, because it's becoming a major problem, absolutely major, and a lot of the accidents certainly could be avoided. And this has got nothing to do with drunk driving. This is just a child who tries to cross the road, doesn't regulate the, the speed of the oncoming vehicle, and gets knocked over. And it's, it's happening far too frequently, particularly amongst the younger population. Um, so that is a bit worrying, I have to say. And then the other uh, reason Ghana has a little bit of a strain on its system is because we're the hub for the counterfeit drug system. And as Brian had mentioned, it is a huge business, 1.7 trillion US dollar business per annum. It is not small. Um, there are several major countries involved, both in Africa and outside of the continent, who are pushing these medicines. Um, there is some pushback coming on board where we have some technological firms developing scratch cards, the system of the scratch card method, uh, that a purchaser can, can scratch the, the um, silver foil on the medication and use their app on their phone to see whether it is a legitimate drug or not. Um, and a company called Sproxel is now working in Nigeria, in Ghana, and in Tanzania, and I think even in Senegal. And certainly I think it's a fabulous program because it involves the government at a very high level as well as the drug manufacturers. But most importantly, one doesn't have to be literate to use it. Um, I think that many of the programs that we do have often presume a level of literacy that is not always present. Mm -hmm. What I like about this particular program and why I pray that it will be successful is that everybody, I mean, 80% of our population have mobile phones and 80% of them are used to refilling their services using the scratch card method. So I think it's a very, very, very important intervention that uh, needs also to be promoted and supported. Uh, Nardo spoke about leadership. Leadership really is essential. Uh, at the current time, we have a president's wife who is very supportive of many of the health interventions that are coming on board. Um, the president himself eloquently discusses them, but it's actually been his wife, I've noticed, who has been much more involved in trying to make sure these uh, advances are sustained and implemented. Um, I think also the last but not least point is the issue of geographic access, um, which is why I think technology is so important. Um, we have some very remote areas in Ghana where you don't have as much telephony as you have elsewhere. And so you'll find that access is limited. And of course, this is often where outbreaks occur. People aren't aware of it until it becomes a community epidemic. And one is then scrambling to try to contain preventable outbreaks. Um, but I do think, as I discussed earlier, that technology might provide us with a bridge to leapfrog over some of our infrastructural deficits. Um, and certainly with the Sproxel example I gave you regarding the counterfeit drugs, I think that's an excellent application of technology. I can speak more to this a bit later, but I'll stop it's there. Good. It's a, you know, the, the, the roads in the, and the accidents on roads just remind me that the two common threads are this transition that countries in Africa are between emerging economies and, and developed. Yes, and that the not always planned for the for the Passover, the the roads issue is a perfect one. So Robert uh, Siegel, the question is, 
uh, why would we invite the CEO of the American Hospital in Paris to a conversation on healthcare in Africa? <laughs> and um, Robert's a, for, a business leader, uh, ran the GE Health business in, in France before uh, taking on the CEO role and uh, has a very interesting perspective on healthcare generally, but also healthcare in Africa, if you would, please. Yes, thank you, Brian. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizer and certainly Thierry de Montbrial for organizing this session. Uh, who can imagine that we will aim at a better world without having better health? It's impossible. So healthcare is certainly a, a founding block of uh, better healthcare. So uh, providing healthcare, if you want to deliver healthcare, uh, whether in France, in the United States, or in Africa, you need basically three things. Basic infrastructure, water, electricity. Then you need healthcare infrastructure, buildings, equipment. And finally, you need human infrastructure, nurses, technicians, and of course, physicians. When you look at Africa today, 47 countries, the situation is of course very diverse. If you look at Maghreb, for instance, uh, there is infrastructure, there is basic infrastructure, and certainly there is healthcare infrastructure. If you look at data regarding the physicians, for instance, and you look at how many physicians you have by 10,000 population, uh, in Maghreb, in Algeria, you have 18 doctors. In Morocco, seven. If you look at South Africa, you are at nine. But now, if you look in between, the situation is not the same. You would be below five, and it can go as low as 0 0.5 physician per 10,000 pe people in Niger. So there is clearly a problem, a quantitative problem. These progress, however, are there. And uh, yesterday we heard Prime Minister Koulibaly who mentioned that the middle class is going to be 800 million people in 10 years. And this middle class is looking for healthcare. And in general, again, who can imagine that in all these countries, solid growth and social justice will occur without solid healthcare. And so in this mood of making progress, I would like to point to two specific domains. The need for quality is number one, and the need for accountability is number two. Need for quality, let me go back to the problem of physicians. Even if you say that in a country you have eight, 10 uh, doctors per 10,000, by the way, for France, we are at 30 for 10,000, in the United States, it's 26. But, so you need to have the good doctors, you need to have specialists, it's not only, there are certain countries in Western Africa, where you have three gastroenterologists for the whole country. So you need to train all those specialists. The second point I would like to, uh, to stress on regarding quality is hospital and healthcare managers. Uh, it's not an issue only for Africa. Believe me, it's an issue where, wherever you are in the world, in France, or as in any other country. You need good hospital managers and this point out, points to my second point, which is accountability. I, there is no shortage, or there are financing and financiers around the world. It can be public, it can be the WHO, it can be the Gates Foundation, so there are money. But all these people are asking the same question, and it can be, of course, private sector, of course. But they're all asking the same question. If I invest one euro, one dollar, whenever, what is the return on investment? Who is accountable for this money? I am ready to put a lot of money, but I want to be sure that there is a return on investment or a value for money, call it whatever you want. So I think that for these two challenges, quality and accountability, technology is an answer. Not the only answer, but it's a very important answer. And let me be a little bit more specific. Number one, technology, of course, is completely uh, linked to modern medicine. In any hospital, in any clinic, you need now modern imaging, MR, CT, you need an operating room with, with, with tools that can deliver on, uh, on, on the needs. So this is one. Now I would like to point to information technology. Information technology is transforming our world, maybe at the cost of uh, the carbon, as was said before, but it's transforming the world. 
And uh, it can be used in several ways. One of them is simply organizing digital education. I spoke about the, the need to enforce and enhance the education of physicians. We are organizing in our hospital every year what we call the gastro training, where we train gastroenterologists of Africa in sight, and at the same time, we have a digital uh, uh, link with several countries in Africa where people can watch, participate to this. And there are a myriad of initiatives for this digital education. Now, another point with digital is continuum of care, and this is very important. Today, what I see and what we're discussing in my hospital, we get a lot of patients coming from Africa, but in many cases, sorry, it's too late. As simple as that, we cannot do a good service for these people. So having teleradiology, telemedical conferences is a tool that able to triage the good patients and to avoid to get patients for which you cannot do anything. And once you treated the patient, you have to follow up on this patient because you can imagine that you need to follow with the local doctors and the local infrastructure, so this is digital uh, uh, information. But you can even think forward, leapfrog. Let me just say something concrete about artificial intelligence. We are using today in our hospital artificial intelligence with mammograms to detect women which are at risk for breast cancer. It's used with genetics and it's used with mammography. So today, in the Western world, artificial intelligence is a help for the radiologist. But you can imagine that tomorrow in Africa, you have a mobile unit with MAMO, no need for a radiologist, and the MAMO is sent to the cloud, a, a, a artificial intelligence program, and is able to detect, as simple as that, and to point to women which are at risk to, for developing a cancer. So this is becoming real now. It's not just a dream, it's becoming real. And finally, the last point about uh, technology, I come back to accountability, it's data. If you are digital, you have more and more data, you're accumulating data, and we know today that in the real world, in the Western world, accountability now is simply data. It's the fact that you're not just speaking with explaining nice things, you show to controllership data. So if we put and, and develop uh, those digital infrastructure, the accountability and the capacity and the will of the payers to sustain the effort will increase. I will just finish with this point. Uh, in my previous life, uh, uh, industrial life, these, it was an American company, and the company understood at some point that it was not, what was good in America was good for other continents. And there was a lot of efforts which were done for, uh, in, in China, for China, in Asia, in, Af in uh, India, for, in for, uh, for India. We can exactly imagine the same for Africa, in Africa, for Africa. And yesterday, we have President Kagame, which was there, everybody knows the IT success for, of Rwanda. You can perfectly imagine that some solution, local solution are invented in Africa, and uh, because they are close to the market, to the needs, they are cost effective, and they are good for Africa. But tomorrow, and this was what happened for in China for China, and in India for India, those, mar those products, which as a beginning were only good for those markets, became good for the entire world. So maybe step one is maybe in Africa for Africa, but step two is why not everywhere in, in, the, in the future? So I am optimistic for so Africa. Thank you, Robert. Let me let Pierre jump in here, and then we'll go to, to all four. Um, uh, Pierre May, uh, Pelé. Um, uh, so it's, uh, you know, mercy ships, mercy hospital ships, but you're a HIV advocate, you're a <laughs> former WHO uh, representative, uh, you're the fourth, so that's either great position or horrible position. Uh, your perspective on what you've heard so far. Uh, merci, uh, sorry. Thank no, you very okay. much, uh, Brian. I wish to, uh, first of all, uh, recognize that the Africa continent uh, over the 20 uh, years, the past 20 years, has made uh, significant progress in improving the health of the people. Uh, despite, of course, the disparities between the regions, the disparities between the uh, countries, and also within the countries. Uh, the Africa continent carries 
25% of the global burden of disease. Uh, home of almost 20% of the world's population and only 2% of the world's doctors. So many challenges, but there is hope somewhere. Uh, in some countries, like uh, Cabo Verde in West Africa, uh, Rwanda in Central Africa, uh, Botswana in the uh, southern part of Africa, and Ethiopia in East Africa. And I would like to uh, highlight what happened in Ethiopia because it's a true success story in health sector strengthening. Mm because of the political leadership and commitment uh, for change, change for health, leadership for action. And uh, Ethiopia over the past 20 years has made impressive progress in improving the health of the Ethiopian people. Uh, Ethiopia just in 2015 concluded uh, health sector development programs from 1997 to 20, 000, uh, 2015, composed of four series of five years. And uh, this amazing work, because Ethiopia achieved almost all related Millennium Development Goals in 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, this health sector development program was based on the a very bold uh, strategy, the health extension program, uh, putting for 5,000 people a health post managed by two nurses, all women. So in a country where you have 100 million people, it's about 18,000 health posts. That is amazing. And uh, of course- All the way down to the local level. To a local. And they do promotion, health promotion, uh, prevention, and they use the uh, uh, new technologies, the smartphone, because of uh, uh, national uh, phone uh, uh, coverage network is uh, used to monitor. Are they, are they networked through yes. digital technology, the yes, 18,000? Yes. Yep. To monitor the pregnancy, to monitor the child immunization. Mm -hmm. So it's about promotion, it's about prevention, it's about care. Uh, you can do the HIV testing, the health post. Mm -hmm. You can monitor the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, you know, uh, uh, a package of key essential health services at low level. And at least two nurses in yes, each post. The two nurses are two women. Mm -hmm. That is very important to see the place of the women mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, uh, a change happening in Ethiopia. And within the community, you also have, it depends on the largest of the uh, wereda, what they call the village. Mm -hmm. So that is 25 to 45 women leaders within the community, uh, so-called uh, Women Development Army. Mm -hmm. I was telling the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, oh, you have maybe the most powerful army in, the, in, the, in Africa. And he said, ah, no. I said, yes, but it's not about the militaries. It's about the Women de uh, Development Army embedded in the community, uh, being the, you know, the link between the two nurses and the community. So let me ask you a question about that and then ask everybody to come in on this, on this question. So you've all talked about infrastructure at some, at some level, whether it's human infrastructure or technology or you know, uh, resources, natural resources. What has, what's the infrastructure requirements that you've seen in going to grounds, you know, versus being centralized at the top of going to ground. And I wonder if, as all four of you would think about, 
Does the infrastructure have to be thought about nationally only? I mean, should we be thinking about these approaches regionally uh, and even regionally outside of Africa? So, Robert, do you think about um, um, an axis from Paris to African countries and that are focused on patients that then have to have infrastructure all along? How, how do you think about infrastructure in this case and how, as you think about scaling innovation, how should we think about organizing infrastructure going forward? Why does it only have to be national or should it be beyond that? Of, of course, maybe Robert will say more. But, no. but I don't think that the infrastructure or health facilities must make a difference. Mm. Of course, we need at all levels, at all low level, at district level, at regional level, and at national level. But I don't think it's the people. The human resources are key to make a difference, right. to improve the health of the people. You can have a beautiful hospital, what we call in French, Elephant Blanc, big with everything. But if you don't have the right, pe the right person, the right doctor, the right nurses, the, the right midwife, so at the training, right, training for at you, the right it? place, <coughs> the, the health of the people will not be improved. Yeah. That is my understanding of the, the, you know, the, what we should do in Africa, making sure that we have the people to do the job. Others? Well, I would, I would go along and say um, one of the things that we haven't mentioned, which I think is very important, is that 85% of most of our patients at any level have usually consulted a traditional healer before coming into the health system mm -hmm. itself. So if we're going to devise a system as you describe here, which is excellent, you have people thereby who actually understand this, and uh, at least potentially, and um, perhaps uh, can incorporate their knowledge of that as well as the traditional healers themselves at some level, where it's regulated, of course, <laughs> and genuine, uh, into the mainstream um, medical system. Because I find that oftentimes we, we speak as medical people as though those people, i.e. the traditional leaders, are messing up what we're trying to do. And in fact, that's not entirely true. There are some cases, there are some illnesses, there are some conditions where it's really important to work hand in hand with the traditional healers. And I think where you have a national program that takes into account the relevance of, national, uh, of traditional healers in the family life, and then you have women who are part of the community who of course assume that this involvement yeah. has taken place, I think that makes for a more effective um, a pr a practice That's of medicine. Yes. Nardos and then Robert. Yeah. I think from my perspective, I kept on saying the ecosystem. We need to have an ecosystem. What do we mean by ecosystem? If a country knows the disease burden, for example, it has to produce the skills that are necessary for that. It has to produce all the infrastructure that you require for that. And this infrastructure should not be a standard one. Mm -hmm. It should be a differentiated one. And we change this over time. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, you know, in, in South Africa, for example, we have supported the CSIR, which is a Council for Science, uh, Innovation, and Research. And working with the Cape Town University, we have turned the biomedical engineering students to be designing, you know, the medical uh, equipments that the country requires. So we have come out with an asthma, uh, equipment by one of the students, which is really something that you can squeeze, easy squeeze, as nothing. We have got, come out with an information technologies like Mom Connect, HIV Connect, and all this, where people subscribe and they share information. Uh, but we have the most important thing is the Anvi Flow, uh, where a device where people can go and be detected, like you said, you know mammogram and all these mobile, yeah. uh, portable things. Yeah. So these are students. You know, we have got the young generation whose DNA is technology. You know, our children come out and they're soft scattered, you know. So, you know, we just have to empower them 
and make sure that the environment is compatible with the needs of the society. So, you know, linking the two is very critical. The other thing, when you talked about sub-regional, when I was in Kenya and we developed this cross-border initiative, there is no need for countries where the borders are there to have one hospital in Kenya, another hospital just 100 meters right, exactly. in Ethiopia. It right. doesn't make sense. Right. The economies of scale. So, you know, what you do is you have the primary you know, centers there and taking you know, advantage of the referral hospital there. So you know, we have to be very strategic in the way we invest. You know? And, and you know, we should think, you know, this is a global world. It's borderless when it comes to problems. To, when it comes to solutions, we have to make it also borderless. It. And enjoy the economic flexible system. and dynamic infrastructure yes. design, yeah. Robert. And then we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience and and um, wrap it up. So regarding infrastructure, um, think global, act local. So this is what Paul Kagame told us yesterday. Uh, he benchmarked essentially with yeah, other did. good practices. So uh, there is no one good solution. You have to think global and act uh, local. Now regarding the, the actors. It's difficult to think that you will deliver good health care in a failed state. It's, the state shall continue to play a key role, there is no doubt about that. But to me, the key answer is pragmatism. You can have the state, you can have academic, you can have private sector, you can have uh, donors. The, it should be pragmatic, but this is my last thing, is again accountability. So deliver, be sure that whatever the plan, you follow up on execution and that at the end of the day you've got execution, local execution. This is really key. And from the beginning to build a plan where you go from the vision to the plan and then to follow up on execution because there are too many stories that we heard about these Elephant Blanc, a nice hospital, nobody's inside. And so this of course is discouraging for the actors. Yeah, it's a line of sight into the operation and then as data becomes more accessible, how do you manage the data? Uh, right here, Jean-Claude, and woman down here, and then right here. We'll take these first three and then see where we are. Well, co <coughs> congratulations for a great discussion. Uh, a very short question for you, Brian. Why, as the CEO of United Way, you care about health in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> because Robert does. I'll answer that. Yes, to the, to the woman, lady down here. <coughs> and then the man in front, and then we'll... Thank you. Um, I want first to join the Mr. Seagal in, in commending the World Policy Conference for uh, dedicating a special panel on uh, healthcare in Africa and asking for attention for that. Uh, because I consider that healthcare in Africa is the single most important challenge uh, African states are facing. So there are a lot of problems. You, you, you spoke about it globally, infrastructure, training, and, uh, and you, so, you know that. There's not one single head of state, African head of state, uh, which, uh, who believes it can be treated in Africa. They all go abroad because they know uh, their hospitals are broken and that they, they sort, of, sort of a wasteland they don't care about. I mean, there are, of course, progress, and you, you spoke about some good examples. But I think of Central Africa, basically. And there's something I just don't understand. I understand lack of uh, training. I understand lack of infrastructure, all the problems you listed. But I don't understand the lack of compassion. I mean, there is so much abuse. Again, the patients there that, you know, people are sort of tortured, they are being ripped off. I mean, we wanted to open a website on, uh, on, on, on the model of Me Too. Just tell about the abuse you are, you are having there. How, how, would so you put, how, would you, the how would you put that into a question? So yeah, that's a question. That how do you tackle that? It's not technology, you, it's not right. infrastructure. The lack of human compassion. That's it. How do you, uh, where do you put it into? Good, Thank you. and then final question here and then we'll see where we are. Right, right here, please. I look for a pen or two. Yeah, it's on uh, infrastructure and how to make some of the white elephants uh, less so. Um, and Juliet knows uh, this, that um, years, uh, decades ago, 
There was a policy in Ghana to build a hospital in each district. Yes. At that time, I don't know how many districts there are now, 110 districts, mm -hmm. and hospitals were built. Yes. And uh, in, in that particular case, it came along with equipment. But I don't think the energy to run these hospitals was thought through, because at that time, if in many, uh, and many, most of these districts are rural districts, of course there are some in the urban centers, if renewable energy, yeah. just solar panels, had been used to provide energy, most of the equipment would probably still be functioning by now. But they were put on the national grid, which, okay, in Ghana, sort of reliable, but the power cuts still happen. And so you find that uh, within a year or two, very sophisticated equipment, you know, put across uh, these hospitals. So you're saying there needs to be an integration of the energy, energy strategy with is, healthcare strategy. Especially as we were just talking about, you know, climate change and energy. The, the that's that's session. very good. So who, how would you? Uh, I, I would just like to. I'm sorry? There's a question. Okay, one more, and then we have to, we have four minutes left, so we're gonna give each one of you an opportunity to react to the questions you've heard. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ouais, je, je vais parler en français, donc mettez vos écouteurs. <rire> Merci. Euh, je, je voudrais apporter ma contribution juste sur trois points. Le premier, c'est les hommes. Je mentirais si je dis qu'aujourd'hui, sur le continent africain, nous n'avons pas de médecins qualifiés, hautement qualifiés. Nous en avons. Mais nous n'en avons pas en quantité suffisante. Et l'accessibilité à ces médecins pose problème parce que le pouvoir d'achat du citoyen lambda est faible pour aller payer une consultation. Ces médecins que je connais, dont je connais, il y a la compétence, et j'en connais beaucoup, dans tous les domaines de spécialité, ils ont un problème. Il y a mon ami Chambas qui a souligné un aspect du problème, mais il y a le problème de l'équipement pour faire les diagnostics. Madame Nardos a évoqué l'aptitude des étudiants africains à inventer. J'ai un compatriote d'origine du Bénin. Moi, je m'appelle Robert Dossou, je suis du Bénin. Je suis un has-been ancien, ancien de beaucoup de choses. Et j'ai un compatriote d'origine béninoise qui a mis au point du matériel médical en Europe et qui est utilisé aujourd'hui dans les hôpitaux en France et ailleurs. Mais ce matériel, on ne l'a pas en Afrique. Ensuite, lorsque le matériel est fabriqué, on ne tropicalise pas souvent. Et les, les vendeurs de, de, matériel, de matériel médical, ils achètent, ils amènent trois jours après, c'est en panne, l'entretien n'y est pas. Mon propre médecin, plusieurs de mes médecins m'ont dit, va faire une radiographie de ceci. Je fais, j'amène, il regarde, il dit, c'est flou. Comme tu es tout en Europe, tu voyages beaucoup, fais, fais ça en Europe, je te fais la prescription. Donc, j'ai profité d'un passage à Paris, j'ai fait le, la radiographie, je lui apporte, ah, il était heureux, mais vous voyez, c'est net, il était heureux. Je suis sorti malheureux. Parce que les films sont importés, gardés sous la chaleur, et au moment de les utiliser, eh bien, tout est flou. Alors, le, la question, c'est même matériel. Ensuite, deuxième point. Deuxième point, c'est les médicaments et, et la médecine traditionnelle. Nous avons négligé et nous avons tué. Alors que, dans toutes les facultés de médecine, de pharmacie et dans les laboratoires, les matières médicales les plus, les plus nombreuses et les plus efficaces sont tout au long des tropiques. Il y en a plein dans les tropiques et nous sommes combattus parfois par les laboratoires pharmaceutiques pour des médicaments traditionnels qui peuvent être valorisés. Je n'en dirai pas plus. Plus, plus les faux médicaments. Okay, merci, merci. Is, les, les faux médicaments. Yeah. Non, les faux médicaments sont à l'ordre du jour au plan mondial. Mais aucun État ne peut lutter contre cela tout seul. Donc, c'est 
un problème vaste et le président français Jacques Chirac est venu à Cotonou lancer ça thank pour you, nous aider. Donc, to, il faut l'inscrire dans les conclusions de notre travail. Je vous remercie. So I would take that, and then, I'm sorry, we have to close with those. I would take that last comment as there are lots of resources in Africa and the world. We're sub-optimizing those resources. We're not taking advantage of whether we're, we're not customizing them to, to local conditions and so forth. But I also, the idea of integration of energy policy and healthcare policy and mm -hmm. you know, the different cabinet ministry level in government. And then finally, this idea of human compassion, mm -hmm. that shouldn't it just be part of our DNA, that healthcare and how we treat each other should be priority one. Yeah, so, any of that, or however you'd like to take 30 to 45 seconds to make your final point. I'd like to and, we'll address, go, and, we'll, and we'll come this way. Sure. This time. We'll come this way. I'd like to address the issue of compassion because Please. it was one of the first problems, if you will, that I had to deal with in setting up a practice in Ghana. Um, I, I had been at Harvard and taught there and set up practices in Boston. And the very first thing that hit me was the seeming lack of compassion. And yes, in many ways, it was a lack of compassion. But the working conditions under which many of the doctors work, it, it, I bring it back to the issue of leadership um, and poor management. The management of the resources within the medical facilities does not support those physicians who put themselves out to, to really do what they're supposed to do. And I think it's almost like, um, systematic trauma that they, they are incurring, both as medical students and doctors, because even during the training, the, the abuse, if you will, starts there. They're expected to work much longer hours than they do in the West, and I do mean much longer hours. Nobody can work for three full days with barely a satisfactory meal and then see a patient and be compassionate. I am not trying to exonerate our healthcare workers. I can assure you I'm not because it is a major, major problem. And, and even hiring skilled workers for the practice that I run, that's one of the first things I look for because I, I, I will not exonerate it. It's not, it's, but I do have a better sense of having practiced for 15 years in Ghana, seeing some of the conditions under which they're being taught. That's why I don't teach at the hospital there because I cannot teach in, the, in that environment. I simply cannot and, and offer quality medicine. It, it's impossible. But I bring it back from the actual physicians themselves who don't know any better at that time to the leadership. You know, we don't have our leaders trained in medical management. The people who run the hospitals are usually physicians themselves that have been plucked because, you know, somebody liked the way they looked and put them in charge of the hospital. That's not adequate, it's not enough, it's not good enough. And so it really is an issue of, of uh, leadership. And I'm, I can be sure that if I were to go to a Rwandan hospital, I haven't been there in a while, but even when I went there decades ago, you could see that people were selecting people based on qualification, not because of some arbitrary interpersonal relationship that they might have with the person. And once you have somebody who understands what quality medicine is and how to get it out of a doctor who has been trained, they will not allow, they will not permit some of the conditions under which those physicians have to work. We lose our doctors annually, annually, because they just give up and move out or into uh, NGOs and, and other organizations. It's, it's a dreadful situation. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. So um, leader, leadership and quality came Absolutely. out of that. Uh, Robert, briefly. Uh, in 1950s, the life expectancy in, in Africa was around 45 years old. Now today we are at 60, a bit yeah. 61. Yeah, 55, 60. Uh, so, so it's still the lowest in the world. It's still the lowest in the world, but it has tremendously progressed. And there are all reasons to think that it will continue to progress. So it's, of course, science. It's, of course, financing. It's, of course, humanity. But it's, of course, leadership. And I think the question, again, in this conference, the question of leadership is absolutely key because you have some force which have to be empowered and drive this effort. Excellent. Here. Again and again. Leadership. The, the problem is not to, to respond to each of the challenges. We will not settle all the problems. 
I think what we need in Africa, leadership, commitment for action, to change the life of the people. I talk about Ethiopia. They are not rich. I talk about Rwanda. 20 years back, they had a genocide. I talk about Capo Verde. It's not a rich country. I talk about Botswana. They have diamond. But we have so many rich countries in Africa. The health sector is failed. They are not able to provide the minimum package of essential health services to their people. Mm. I think the problem in Africa, we need leaders in their involvement to change the life, the situation of their people. Very good. Nardos. I'll start with the uh, compassion, but I would expand it a little bit. In the entire world, it's not Africa, values and standards have really gone down, completely down. Um, and therefore, you know, the world has to think on how to really bring back societal values, family values, professional values into the forefront, truly. Uh, and I think this should be a discussion, you know, a universal global discussion, and not really specific to, to, to Africa. Mm. Yes, you know, uh, the compassion and passion is associated with the means, you know, with the environment. And again and again, what I said first comes, you know, when we plan in a silo, we will never get anywhere. So we have to start adopting an integrated planning, an integrated budgeting, you know, and develop ecosystems. And therefore, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, what uh, uh, my big brother, uh, uh, Robert Dosus just said, when we talk about healthcare system, we shouldn't look at it from just one aspect of it, which is a treatment. We should look at it from the preventive side to the treatment, you know, the whole integrated, you know, system. And looking at all environment, when you plan, you have to really know where are the disease burdens and how many medical doctors in what fields we should train them. And then the institution should respond to that. Yeah. You know, academic institutions should produce them. So, you know, we have to really look at research institutions. Like I said, you know, the biomedical engineering, you know, they do engineering, they go out. Of course, they, are, they run out of job because it's not relevant to the socioeconomic development. We do everything outside the socioeconomic development needs of the country, and that's where we, we run into problem. Um, just one thing, I think also for Africa, we need to really move out from thinking of and talking about just all the time what we don't have, and really highlight on what we have and on how to scale it up. There are many best practices everywhere. Right. There are many best institutions everywhere. Each country cannot afford to have research institutions, but it can piggyback on an institution that exists. CSIR in South Africa is top-notch institution, innovation centers. African governments and leaders come there, they don't even visit that, is, uh, that uh, research institution. So we have to really know, really know on how to share our resources yeah. and on how to, uh, to talk about, you know, highlights about prosperity, what are the areas, points of excellence that we can uh, share with others. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. You know, this is one of those examples. Yeah, please. Um, that we could take a great deal more time, but that's what lunch is for, that's what hallway conversation is for. <laughs> Let me finish with uh, this one thought. Um, United Way is the largest privately supported NGO in the world. We generate about $5 billion US per year. And one of the things we've learned, and you heard here, is that no longer is innovation and scaling gonna come from the top down or the center out. It's going to come from the out in and the bottom up. And whether it's individuals, patients, countries, um, we're growing very quickly in India, Mexico, uh, China, now starting in Africa, because we're coming bottom up. Scaling healthcare will, as I think you heard, be about leadership, quality, transparency, but in engagement of individuals. 
uh, patients driving their, their own care and our institutions responding, responding to that. That's why we care about healthcare in Africa. Uh, bon appetit, have a great lunch.